and Good afternoon, everyone. Wanted to wait till the president finished up with his remarks on the budget before I came out. Uh, as you saw, he's uh, had a really good opportunity to sit down with his team. It's uh, clearly been a busy day here at the White House again, so I'm going to kind of keep it quick and get to your questions. This morning, after receiving his daily intelligence briefing, the president met with Secretary of State Tillerson. As you all know, Secretary Tillerson and Secretary Kelly will travel to Mexico City later today as one of their first foreign trips. It's significant that the president is sending the secretaries to Mexico so early in the administration. It's a symbolic, uh, it's symbolic of the meaningful relationship that our two nations have. These are important meetings regarding the president's agenda to improve the quality of lives for both people uh, of Mexico and the United States by combating drug traffickers and finding ways to bolster both our, our, our economies through a broader relationship that promotes commerce and legal immigration. This is a very encouraging start to a working relationship with an incredible part, uh, neighbor to the South. At this moment, uh, the President has just wrapped up his discussions on the federal budget uh, with some of the officials and staff who will be instrumental in the work to put this country back on a responsibly fiscal path. Uh, joining the, the, uh, the meeting were Ryan's previous Chief of Staff, Steve Bannon, Jared Kushner, Gary Cohn, the Director of the National Economic Council, Secretary Steve Mnuchin of the Department of Treasury, Director Mick Mulvaney of the Office of Management and Budget, Russ Vogt of the Office of Management and Budget, and Emma Doyle of the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, as the President mentioned last week, we look forward to presenting our tax reform plan and providing much needed tax reform uh, and relief to the hardworking men and women of our nation. The President's going to restore and respect the American taxpayer by enabling uh, them to keep more of their hard earned money and by making sure the federal government spends money more responsibly. After the the lunch, the President will continue this important discussion with other members of the senior staff. Additionally, the Vice President today is in St. Louis to participate in listening sessions with American workers and employees of the Fabic Cat Equipment and Engineer Dealer, a 100-year-old family-owned and operated business. During his visit, the Vice President will discuss the economic comeback in store for our nation under the President's econ uh, economic agenda and with small business owners and employees. The President has already made strides towards slashing redundant regulations through his executive actions, and we will work with Congress to enact further pro-growth legislation. Uh, back to the President's schedule. Later this afternoon, the President will participate in his standing legislative affairs strategy session. Our legislative affairs team is in constant contact with our counterparts on the Hill, keeping an open dialogue on all aspects of the President's agenda. Last week alone, more than 40 different Senator and Congress uh, members of Congress visited the White House. On the Supreme Court front, so far Judge Gorsuch has now met with 58 Senators, 36 Republicans and 22 Democrats, and he has more meetings already on the books for next week when the Senate returns uh, to session. We've been especially encouraged by the reception he's received from se several senior Democrats, including Senators Feinstein, Tester, Durbin and Gillibrand. Also on the confirmation front, uh, multiple unions came out today. Uh, for Alex Acosta, the President's nominee for Labor Secretary. Both the Labor's International Union of North America and the International Union of Operating Engineers praised his distinguished career and pledged their support for his nomination. The Legislative Affairs team is using the Congressional work period to coordinate with key coalitions in Congress. Uh, they are meeting with different groups in the House and the Senate, including the staff of the Congressional Black Caucus, House and Senate leadership, and staff throughout various committees. We've used this work period as an opportunity to invite staffers from both sides of the aisle to come to the White House and discuss shared priorities and find common ground on the way forward. And we're not just reaching out to Capitol Hill. We've actively engaged with key leaders and policymakers around the country. It's critical to this administration that we gather input from states uh, and from people throughout the country rather than just leaders here in Washington. Looking ahead to tomorrow, the President will meet with a group of world-class business leaders to discuss specific action he can take to remove barriers to job creation. These leaders, many of whom represent some of the country's largest manufacturers, will begin the day in working groups with the Vice President, Cabinet members, and key aides of the President's staff. The working groups will engage in a deep dive conversation on the attendees' specific area of expertise. Topics of discussion include deregulation, tax and trade, training and the workforce of the future, and infrastructure. 
Vice President Pence will be engaged with each of the groups. And after the groups conclude their discussion, the President's staff will compile the feedback and the President will sit down with the entire group for a listening session on some of their recommendations. As you can tell by the structure of the meeting, the President is expecting these interactions to lead to real action being taken by the administration. Creating a dynamic and booming economy that works for all Americans is, continues to be at the top of his domestic policy agenda. As a successful businessman himself, the President knows that if we're going to get the country back to work, we need to hear directly from job creators what is holding them back and where appropriate take steps to remove the barriers. In his first month in office, the President has already taken numerous actions to boost job creation and a key economic and key economic indicators are showing that it's working. CEO, CEO and confidence are up, the stock market continues to reach record highs, and the January numbers were strong. Uh, the meetings on Thursday will continue to build on that momentum. And with that, I'm glad to take some questions. Sean, Steve John, Holland. Steve Holland's not here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sean, Jeff Mason gets it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Sean. Can you give us an update on the administration's plans with regard to transgender bathrooms? And can you confirm uh, in schools? And can you confirm that there is, has been some uh, disagreement between Secretary DeVos and the Attorney General on this issue? Uh, so I would expect further guidance to come out on that today. Um, the President, as I said yesterday, is a firm believer in states' rights. Um, when you look at the guidance that was issued under the Obama administration, first of all, let's remember, to the best of my knowledge, that, that was stalled, uh, never fully implemented. And I think there were various reasons for that, um, several legal reasons and several procedural reasons. Um, and so the Department of Education and the Department of Justice, both who jointly issued that guidance back during the Obama administration, are now working together again under a Trump administration. They've been reviewing the guidance that was signed, the basis by which it was put through, and I think there have been several areas of concern, both legal and procedural, um, that they have been discussing. And I think where you might be hearing something is more on the timing and the wording of stuff, the conclusions everybody in the administration is agreed upon. Uh, there's no daylight between anybody, between the President, between any of the Secretaries. I think there's been some discussion between the timing of the issuance um, and recommendations or between the exact wording. But as far as the conclusions go, um, I've made this clear and the President's made it clear throughout the campaign that he's a firm believer in states' rights and that certain issues like this are not best dealt with at the federal level. Sean, Sean. Uh, Sean a report uh, out today that some cabinet secretaries are bristling at what they see as the White House micromanaging staffing at the sub-cabinet right. level. To, to what degree does the White House think that it should uh, in, impose its uh, hiring uh, approvals on members of the sub-cabinet? And is, is some of this at least partially driven? by cabinet secretaries wanting to appoint people who might not necessarily be aligned with the president's thinking? Well, I, I mean, I, I think when, it, when you come to, they're called political appointees for a reason. The idea is that people who come into this government should um, want to support and enact the president's agenda that he campaigned on with the American people. And I think one of the reasons that you, you see in recent polls, the president, people, even if they don't agree with the president, they give him high marks for following through on the promises that he's made to the American people and getting things done that he actually said, which is not always the case here in Washington. Um, and I think that we want to make sure that the people who staff a Trump administration are committed to a Trump agenda. Um, and that's, the, you know, so cabinet secretaries and other administrators and directors have broad discretion. But I think at the end of the day, no matter what position you have, whether it's you know, the lowest or the highest in, this, in the White House uh, or in a department or agency, we should be making sure that people who are coming in as appointees of the president support the president's agenda. And I think that's, that's one thing. This isn't about getting a job um, as, a, as, a, as a federal employee where you're subject to certain you know, restrictions as to what you can and can't do as a benefit of being a federal employee. These are political appointees. And so I think that there is obviously going to, we are going to ensure that people who are political appointees share the vision and agenda that the president campaigned on and is implementing. And does the White House believe that it needs to have the uh, final approval of I don't think people, this is or, or can you trust your cabinet secretary? It's not a question of trust. It's a question of just making sure that that we are all in a, on the same page and and um, and committed to the same agenda that the president set forth. This process. Um, is probably no different than we've seen in previous administrations. Um, cabinet secretaries come to the president with recommendations on who they want, um, and it depends on the position, obviously. Um, but in certain cases, if they're going to fulfill 
a job that is a key area that the president had very specific goals to enact that he promised the American people. You want to make sure that the person that is fulfilling that job actually is committed to the agenda and the vision that the president set forth and promised the American people. And that's so there, there is that's that's something that we're always going to be making sure is, is in alignment. And is this approval process in some way slowing down the no. appointment of crucial staffers? No, not at all. I, I don't think so. I think when you look across where we are and we track the number of folks that are in the pipeline, um, we're doing very, very well with getting all of these positions filled. And, and I think once in a while you might hear of one or two people. But overall, generally speaking, I mentioned during the transition period how many members of the beachhead teams that we had. Um, and I think we, we've, those members who are appointed through the beachhead process had 120 days. And they were there to allow, you know, a, a basically a four-month process for secretaries in the White House to make sure that people uh, on a permanent basis could populate those positions. And that's what's happening. But make no mistake, I mean, we were ahead of the curve on the beachhead teams. We were very clear with the landing teams during the transition. This has been a very methodical process that has seen um, from top to bottom through, and I think we're doing a phenomenal job of staffing the government. John. Margaret. Oh, um, thank you. Oh, which one? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lucky me. Okay, great. <laughs> but two Margaret's. Well, I'm going to take mine. Yeah. I got a Bloomberg go question for you. Um, <laughs> I'm <have> a show. <laughs> <laughs> the president um, in the Roosevelt Room just said to us that, um, among other things, that uh, the tax plan is nearly finalized, but it can't be submitted until the health care plan, statutorily or otherwise, is. So we are doing the health care. So what I wanted to clarify was: Is the White House doing a health care proposal, or was he talking about? Uh, Congress and not the White House, or is there well, obviously, yeah, I think uh, right. Yeah. So obviously, there's two vehicles, reconciliation vehicles. The FY17. I'm going to give you a Bloomberg answer. Uh, <laughs> the FY17 reconciliation uh, that was never completed because the, the budget wasn't finalized in the last Congress, and then you got the 2018. I think we want to make sure, look at the opportunities to work with Congress and Obamacare, utilizing the 2017, and then you could utilize the 2018 reconciliation and budget process to do tax reform. Uh, that's not, and again, that's not prescriptive. I'm not, but as far as why the president's saying it that way is because we've got that option available to us right now, and I think uh, the president's committed to making sure that um, the promise that he made to the American people to repeal and replace Obamacare continues to be fir first and foremost, and then his tax plan. But it's not, a, it's not a, you know, we can walk and chew gum kind of thing. We can actually be continuing to work with Congress and the leadership in both houses. Well. I, I so just to do the Bloomberg timeline, um, there's a few things that are going to happen then. There's going to be a, uh, a budget plan that you guys are going to present on March 13th-ish. Ish. Ish. Um, <clears throat> there's going to be a health care, this is where I got lost again, something from him and something from them and a tax reform plan afterwards. Is that the way it works? I, I don't want, look, when we're ready to announce stuff, but I think, again, I think you've got Obamacare, the budget, and tax reform. It's going to be a very busy uh, March and April for us, um, and we've been continuing to work with Congress to make sure that that's implemented. Noah Bierman. Uh, yeah, um, the President, you were talking about fulfilling his promises. As you know, he promised during the campaign a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the country. There were a lot of people in his party who thought that was a very good proposal. Can you explain his evolution in backing down from that? And can you also say whether he regrets using that rhetoric since it ended up hurting the court case? Well, again, I, I go back to the merits of the case um, and the order that gives him the authority to make that. Um, U.S. Code 1182 is very clear. And the President was very clear in his executive order uh, that these were countries that we didn't have uh, the proper vetting for when it came to uh, ensuring the safety of Americans. Um, that's what the executive order said. The authority is very clear to have him done it, and I think that you're going to continue to see the president take the steps necessary to protect this country. That's why he's talked about, you know, fighting this on both fronts, making sure that we keep evolving through the court system on the existing EO, and then looking towards the next draft of the executive order that will continue to achieve the goal of protecting the American people. So I, I that that's where we are. That's what the order says, um, and and so I think we continue to feel confident that uh, that that's. But, but it was crafted in a way that was very clear about the countries and was not focused on anything else but, but the vetting requirements that we have um, to make sure that we know who's coming into this country and that they're here uh, not to do us any harm. But when talking about fulfilling his promises, can you explain why he decided to back down from that one? Because I know you I, I don't differentiated think, I, this I, from I think that he, he's made it very clear, Noah, from the beginning 
um, that this was a country focused issue, a safety focused issue, and that's why he issued. I don't, I don't see anything other than that uh, with reference to that. Deborah Saunders. Um, the, um, the Oscars are, are Sunday night. Will the president be watching? Uh, if there's a Meryl Streep kind of moment, how do you think he'll react? And why, if this has happened at other award ceremonies, why do you think this happens? What happens? Uh, actresses and actors like Meryl Streep. I, I have no idea. It's a free country. Um, I, I think Hollywood is known for being f rather far to the left um, in its opinions. And uh, i got to be honest with you, I think the president will be hosting the governor's ball that night. Uh, Mrs. Trump looks forward to putting on a phenomenal event. Um, and the first ladies put a lot of time into this uh, event that's going to occur and welcoming our nation's governors to the Capitol. And I have a feeling that, that that's where the president and the first lady are going to be focused on on Sunday night. And um, and so we'll go from there. Yeah. Sean, the president's going to have a big audience next Tuesday in the joint address to yes. Congress. Does he have a set of goals in mind for the speech? And do you think we're going to see some specific policy rollouts uh, as part of that speech? Um, I think that the speech is going to focus. I mentioned this yesterday. I think it's, it's going to talk. Um, remind the American people what he's done already um, and make sure that that he explains to them not not just because it's a sense of accomplishment uh, that in moving this country forward but because I think it's important for the American people to know that he was an agent of change he came here to get things done um, and he didn't waste any time um, he's committed to keeping his word um, and then I think he's going to lay out his vision and talk about things like education and health care and infrastructure um, the, the problems that we face as a country, the violence in some of our inner cities, but also some of the solutions that we can act on and some of the partnerships that we can create. Um, it's obviously still a work in progress, but I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to look forward um, to where he wants to take this country and talk about working with Congress and other leaders throughout the country to get things done. Um, but I, I think in, in the drafts that I've seen so far, um, it is going to be a very strong blueprint of where he wants to take this country. Um, in the past, I think a lot of presidents, or some presidents rather, have gotten into very detailed specifics. I think you're going to see him try to talk about policies in a broad sense of where he wants to take this country and where what the what defining success is, what that goal means. Um, but but it's still a work in progress, and hopefully towards the end of the week. Is the tone going to be optimistic? Absolutely. Sunny. Yeah, I think um, he is. this is an opportunity for him to lay out a very positive vision for the nation. Um, and to really let America know wh where we can go and how we can get there um, and the potential that we have as a nation. Anita. I'm just piggybacking on that, and then I have another question. Will he, I know past presidents, including President Obama, immediately hit the road after, I know this isn't a State of the Union, but something like a State of the right. Union address, to sell policies. And since you're saying it's more of a vision, does he anticipate doing, going Yeah, I think there'll be some doing? travel. Um, I, I don't want to, that's, that's evolving right now. Um, there's a lot of things that, um, that we're trying to look at and I think as we look at the speech and some of the objectives and goals and vision that he's sharing um, talk to him about potential places to go to highlight that um, but I think you're gonna see you know a, a fair amount of, of visits in the next few weeks um, to highlight some of the places that he wants to take it. And then the other thing was I've seen um, some members of Congress were here last week there's the legislative meeting today. Yeah. It feels as if we haven't seen as many executive actions or executive orders. I know we have the one uh, vetting one coming out this week. Are, are we in a different phase now that he's sort of done the executive orders that no. he wants to do and we're going to we legislate? Have, we have several that are in the pipeline. Um, and part of it is just, you know, this, these days, you know, are focused with, with these meetings and getting things done and um, trying to plan ahead. And so as we see fit and as they, the implementation process of a lot of these goes through the process, uh, we'll have future, we'll have plenty more. But I, I, I should. There's more legislative emphasis right well, now. Well, it's a both. And I think part of this is we work through Congress. You know, Anita, these are, these are big things, right? We're talking about fundamental tax reform, something that hasn't happened in our nation since 1986. The repeal and replacement of Obamacare, which, you know, was mammoth. And I think part of this is that those things take time. He's got a joint address on Tuesday. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening, and therefore um, we need to kind of uh, make sure that we appropriately use the schedule. But but I, I can assure you that if you're if you've missed executive orders, you're going to see a bunch. Uh, I know. I just want to make sure you know, Jonathan Carl. Uh, Sean, I want to ask you about the uh, the town halls and yeah. what you're hearing about Obamacare. 
Uh, the president referred to so-called angry crowds at these town halls. Is he suggesting this is manufactured anger? Uh, that this is not real anger and real concern? Yeah, I, thanks. I think there, there's a hybrid there. Um, I think some people are clearly upset, but there is a bit of, of professional protester manufactured base in there. Um, but there obviously there are people that are upset. But I also think that when you look at some of these districts and some of these things, it is it is it is not a representation of a member's district or an incident. It is a loud group, small group of people disrupting something in many cases uh, for media attention. No offense. Um, it's just I think that's that necessarily just because they're loud doesn't necessarily mean that there are many. Um, and I think in a lot of cases that's that's what you're seeing. Does the um, president doubt that there's real anger and real oh, concern out there beyond just a few loud agitators, that there's real concern that people may lose their But they won't. It, 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 see, I think that that's a false narrative. And I, I don't – the president has been very clear. Look, you, you have to look at what our health care system is right now. In so many counties around our nation, we've gone down to one provider. That's not choice. That's not access. And then they're going in a lot of cases and they're saying we're not taking Medicaid, we're not taking TRICARE. We're not taking the insurance you used to have. The doctor that you used to have isn't participating anymore. And oh, by the way, states like Arizona, you've got over 100 percent increase in premiums. 112, I think, was the number there. In many states, it's double, triple, di you know, double digit. And I think that the idea that we have to re remember is that the American people got sold the Affordable Care Act. It's neither affordable or accessible. They're losing their coverage, and premiums are spiking. And so if people are truly worried about losing their coverage, they should be applauding the president's action for wanting to make sure that we put a system in place that, that does what they were supposed to have been promised a while back. And I think that's, that's what I think is missing from this dialogue. I've seen some folks that you know, were protesting at some of these things um, saying, I lost, I'm on Obamacare, I'm going to lose my thing. And when they were asked how old they were, they were, oh, I'm 71, 72. Well, they're not on Obamacare. They're on Medicaid. So you think they're making it up? No, I'm not they're making it up. But that what I'm getting at is I think that there is a lot of blurring of the facts. And the reality is that some people aren't on Obamacare. They're on an employer-based system. They're on Medicaid. They're, they're receiving their benefits through Medi excuse, Medicare uh, because of their age. And so that they're in they're nothing, you know, they, they have no problems. But I think in other cases, people are not being told that the plan that they're on is unsustainable, that these carriers throughout the country, I mean, you just look at them over and over again pulling out of the exchanges. The reality is, is that they are losing their health care. But they're losing it under Obamacare because the exchanges are collapsing on themselves, carriers are pulling out, premiums are going up, and, ex and, and access is going down. So the president's plan is actually going to do exactly what they were promised eight years ago and didn't get. So for those who are worried, the answer is help is on the way. But what is the plan? We haven't seen uh, it. Uh, okay, so first, we're, we're, I, as the president made clear, we're going to have that out in the next couple of weeks. He's working on it. But the goal, Jonathan, is this got jammed through a, a Democratic Congress. And then they told us you could read it after we get it passed. So taking our time, getting this right to achieve the goals that we set forth is probably the right thing to do considering the experience that we had the last time. Hallie. Sean, two questions for you. Um, the issue of transgender bathrooms wasn't one we heard a lot about from the president during the campaign. He said at one point, Caitlyn Jenner could use whichever bathroom she wanted to at Trump Tower. So why is this now a priority for the administration 40 days into office? It's not a, it's not a priority. I think there's a it's case. The no, no, hold on. It's a, but let me answer the question. It's not a priority. There is a case pending in the Supreme Court in which we have to decide whether or not to continue to issue guidance to the court. We, it's, not, it's, it, it's dictated by that. The Obama administration had issued joint guidance from the Department of Education and the Department of Justice. We now have to decide whether or not this administration wants to continue that track that they were on. It's plain and simple. If we don't, um, but there are problems both in the legal and process way in which that guidance was issued. And so it's incumbent upon us to actually follow the law and to recognize that Title IX never talked about this. It was enacted in 1972. There was no discussion of this back then. And to assume certain elements of the law were, were thought of back then with respect to this would be completely preposterous. And to, to be clear, Secretary DeVos is on board with this? Yes, 100%. Thank you. Second President, oh, sorry, second Maybe question. Sean, that was actually clear. The second question was on Mexico, the Secretary of State's trip that is tonight <laughs> along with Secretary Kelly. Yeah. Um, obviously, there have been tensions, right, between the Mexican President and President Trump. Is this a cleanup job for the Secretary of State? No, I think that um, President Peña Nieto and President Trump spoke uh, again. The foreign ministers uh, had several contacts with their staff. Uh, I would argue that 
we, we have a very healthy and robust relationship with the Mexican government and Mexican officials, and I think they would echo that same sentiment. President Peña Nieto has echoed that as well. Uh, but I think the relationship with Mexico is phenomenal right now, and I think there's an unbelievable and robust dialogue between our two nations. President Trump and Canadian Prime Minister. Let me go, Margaret, and then I'll get you. Thank you. Um, on Syria, General Votel indicated today that the U.S. needs to take a larger share of the burden and perhaps send troops to Syria. Has the President discussed this with his national security team, and when does he intend I, I, I'm going to refer you back to DOD on that. I would just argue that I think you've seen the President talk about safe harbors in Syria with several foreign leaders. Uh, who have shared his safe havens. Thank you. Um, and that is an area of, uh, at the top of the President's foreign policy agenda that he's continued to talk to leaders, especially in the Middle East, about um, trying to make sure that we deal with, with, that, era, with that issue in that area right now. Um, but I'm not going to get ahead of, of the DOD on this. And then when they have recommendations, they'll make them forward to us. Is there an NSC president? on it, though? Has huh? he talk, has the president I'm not going to. I, I will, if, if I have an update, I'll give it to you tomorrow. Again. President Trump and the Canadian Prime Minister wants the U.S. and Canada Council for Advancement of Women Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how the council is growing and transpiring? What's the status? I think uh, staff is beginning to implement the president's agenda. It occurred, what, six, seven days ago. Uh, and so it's starting to work through the process, and we'll have uh, further updates as it goes forward. But I know that he continues to be in touch with, with, um, with Prime Minister Trudeau, and, and our staff continues to do to work on the back end. Uh, to make this happen. Zeke. Thanks, Sean. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, one uh, earlier in conversation with John uh, about does the, does the White House not have confidence in its cabinet secretaries if it's looking sort of over their shoulders and whom they're taking? Do they, does the White House not, does the President not Trump, uh, trust his uh, his cabinet secretaries and appointees and agency administrators to staff to find people who agree with the President's agenda? No, not at all. I think there's a big difference. Um, the President named these folks because they're an unbelievably qualified uh, individuals. Um, part of it, though, is that you're staffing major departments. And I think we've got somewhere in the area of 5,000 positions to fill. And when you're filtering through a good number of people, I don't even think the secretaries, at some degree, depending on the department and the, you know, have a full background on some of these individuals. And so as they get pumped through the pipeline, there are questions. And again, there are areas of that, that, um, that are of key priority to the president that he campaigned on. And I think that when he wants to make sure that certain of those individuals who are going to be overseeing key priorities that he promised the American people um, have somebody who is not only qualified but agrees with and shares the president's vision to fix whatever problem that was or fulfill whatever vision that he articulated. But I think that that, that I mean, it would almost be malpractice not to do that, to allow people to fill a job, a political appointee job, who don't share the vision and agenda of the President of the United States would almost be ridiculous. I mean, it would be silly on its face to suggest this. I don't think there's any administration in past history uh, that would literally willingly take on somebody who was adamantly opposed or spoke out specifically against uh, what the President was seeking to do and then have them fulfill a job to carry out that mission. It just it doesn't seem um, as though it makes any sense. Yeah. Sure. Well, second thing, real quick, um, okay. just on the, uh, um, we're coming up a, a week away from the deadline the president ordered uh, for his review of the, uh, the counter ISIS strategy. Um, what's the status of that review? The president tweeted over the weekend that he had been meeting with a bunch of generals. Yeah. Was that regarding, was that regarding that review? He is, um, I, I think General Dumford and Secretary Mattis uh, have provided, have begun providing him updates on that. Um, I know that the new national security advisor is getting brought into that process and continuing to do updates. So we'll have further updates, but the team has been working on it since the President issued the guidance. Yeah. As far as the second executive order is concerned, what is the White House doing differently uh, in terms of consulting with the various departments to make certain that the second executive order passes constitutional scrutiny? Well, um, I think we've done a few things. One is I think we've been very clear about understanding what the court said. Um, and trying to tailor that specifically while achieving the same goals of keeping America safe and ensuring that people don't come into this country that seek to do us harm. That's number one. Number two is, you know, we continue that and that order is, 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 is basically completed. I think what we're now doing is working with the various agencies and departments to make sure that the implementation of that uh, is done in an in a extremely smooth way. So we have uh, looked at it from both a process standpoint as well as a you know, uh, legal standpoint, and I think it's it's going to it's achieving the goals. But again, I, I would also mention uh, that on the merits, we, 
we can see, you know, I, I believe that the first order did just that. Um, it was it was written in a way, and I think ultimately we will continue to prevail on that, um, because it is written in a way that is clear and consistent with U.S. code and the authority that the president has to protect the nation. Katie. No matter, no matter what Sean. happens as it relates to the second executive order, it's almost likely to face a legal challenge. For sure. Are you concerned that the president's prior remarks as it relates to the judiciary is going to uh, allow him to get a fair uh, hearing by the ju judicial branch as it relates to the second executive order? Yeah, absolutely. Order? I think Why? that I, because I think that you've seen it happen in the Massachusetts case. I mean, at the end of the day, you look at the law and what the order does. And I, I think, again, you may have, in the case of the Ninth Circuit, um, we, we continue to disagree with that. I, don't, I just, I think, you know, the President's pointed out, you don't have to be that high up, you know, in, in grade school to recognize what the, the code says, what the authority that is granted to him, and then what the order does. I think w the things that they brought out in that order I mean, in one of the cases they suggested none of there's been no people that have entered within the seven countries, and a quick cursory look found you know upwards of close to 20 people that had come in. So some of the basis for which they they decided the case on doesn't actually pass muster. And I think any other judge or judges that look at the, that order or the one that will be put forward will come to the same conclusion. Katie. Sean, I wanted to ask about the president's budget priorities. Yeah. What specifically is the president increasing spending on? Where is he de decreasing spending? And how much money specifically is he asking for the 5,000 new board patrol agencies asked for? So I'm going to refer you back to Margaret's question. Uh, and then we'll have something in mid-March as we put that out. But I'm not going to get ahead of uh, Director Mulvaney. No, I mean, it's not. It, look, he just had a meeting uh, where he's continued to work out. They're providing him back and forth. I mean, that's the idea of crafting this budget. And, and uh, until we till we put it out on paper, I don't want to get ahead uh, of, of Mexico. Oh, Sean. Yeah. Thank you very much. Back to Mexico. Um, Videgaray and many officials have said this morning that they're not going to accept the directives that were put out by the White House and by DHS yesterday. And they may not take anyone that's not a Mexican immigrant. What are you guys going to do with those I, people that Mexico I think Secretary Tillerson and, and Secretary Kelly are going to have a great discussion down there um, and to walk through the implementation of the executive order. Uh, but I feel very confident that um, any country who has a citizen that comes into this country and that we send back will we'll make sure that they comply with this. Uh, David. I two questions about immigration on SAS at the same time. One, um, the President has talked a number of times about millions of illegal immigrants casting votes during the election in his mind. You guys have promised to look into that. It seems right. like there was no mention of that in any of these directives to look for these immigrants. Does the President still believe this? Yeah, uh, I mean, he's mentioned problem? that Vice President uh, Pence will lead a task force on this. Where would we stand on that? So he named the task force. Um, and the Vice President is starting to gather names and individuals to be part of it. Uh, on the other question I had about um, a DACA program, mm -hmm. uh, during the, yesterday you suggested, well, we have to go after hardened criminals, right. and, you know, uh, major national security threats first. But during the campaign, the President talked <coughs> about uh, DACA as being an unconstitutional executive amnesty. Does he still think it's an un it was an unconstitutional use of President Obama's powers? And if so, I, I think, he, yeah, I think like and I, and I said this yesterday, David, but the, the president is very clear about his priorities with respect to immigration. Yesterday was focused on going after people who are a concern, a public safety concern, or and and we're going to walk through this very. I I, I, I will, we will get back to you on that. Um, right now, the focus is on keeping the country safe and making sure that we walk through Shane. I want to ask on yeah. immigration as well. Uh, given all of the uh, the push on deporting illegal immigrants, I wanted to see if this White House and President Trump have any interest in curtailing legal immigration going forward. Uh, again, let's we got to look at this from a priority level. Right now, we, the, there's you know millions of people in this country that are in the country illegally. Uh, I think the focus continues to be that eight or nine hundred thousand that have already had an order to have them removed and get them processed through uh, in a way that continues to keep the America safe. Legal immigration, obviously, is a completely separate subject, uh, and that includes B visa reform and all that other stuff. Uh, the President's talked about that. He's talked about it with business leaders, H-1B visas, et cetera. Um, you're going to see more of that coming, but I think there's a prioritization of how we deal with immigration, both illegal and then legal, and we'll have more on that later. i got to run. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care.